to alternate with a big group of scientists, engineers, and astronomers. And we are going to communicate with a telescope that is going to be 1 million miles away from Earth. And it is extremely exciting, and it is also very challenging. So I thought to start this presentation sharing with you how uh, part of the challenges and the excitement that we are going to live in the first six months where we test the performance of the telescope and we make sure that Webb is going really to donate us the, uh, all the um, rich uh, scientific results that we hope to get. And when I think that with Webb, I will be able to explore the uh, um, end of the universe, I really feel like I am on board of an amazing starship and uh, I'm ready to explore the end of the universe. So after we will talk about uh, our web of Yes. Sorry to interrupt. Um, there's a bit of an echo. Do you have um, the YouTube open perhaps? Grace, it was okay with me. I didn't hear it. And Mr. William also confirmed that with Zoom, we didn't hear an echo. Okay, then my apologies. I'm so sorry. Maybe it's on my end. Okay. Ignore me. I, I will turn it back over to you. Oh, well, I excuse me for the interruption, but also someone said that there was no, okay, good. We're good. Thank you. But now you're muted. Okay, so in addition to talk about how web is working, I'm also going to talk to you, uh, to talk with you about uh, the process of star formation, what we hope to learn thanks to web new capabilities. And I want to push our curiosity a little bit farther because with web, we will be able to study in detail the process that leads to the formation of extrasolar planets. And we hope to understand how complex molecules like water, methane, and um, uh, I don't know, the, these complex molecules arrive on Earth and they can enable then uh, life. So for all these reasons, uh, we had to um, launch a very big telescope. We had to put it into space and we had to start to study the universe at wavelengths that are not accessible from the human eyes or for example, a telescope like Webb. And we are looking at the universe in this new, in this special light that is called the infrared light. The infrared light was chosen because we want to answer four main questions. The first one is try to understand how the universe looked like at the beginning. We already know, thanks to Hubble, that the early galaxies were very different. They were smaller, they were more irregular, and we want to see the first one to know when they light up. We also know, we also want to use web to understand how we moved from this initial little galaxies to the majestic system that are the spiral galaxies and the giant elliptical galaxies that we see in the nearby universe. And now, regardless of the age of the galaxies that we're looking at, they are all filled with stars and stars are constantly changing the face of these galaxies. So understanding the life cycle of the stars, how they form, how they evolve, how they explode, are all key questions to understand the entire evolution of our universe. And of course, we live on a small planet. We want to know how did we arrive here? And so we want to explore other worlds to better understand our own world. Um, so far we've explored the universe in great detail in the optical using um, a very small part of the radiation that is coming from the sun, the galaxies and other, um, and other stars. However, every exosome, every astronomical source is emitting much more radiation than just the visible light that we can see with our eyes. And in fact, we can uh, get the light that is coming from the very energetic gamma ray and X-ray down to the microwave and radio wavelengths. All together, the light that is coming from, this from um, any astronomical sources is called electromagnetic spectrum. And looking at a, a star or a galaxy at different wavelengths give us information about different physical processes. So it's important if you want to have a full picture of how the universe operates to look at the universe in all its colors. 
And so in addition, we've learned a lot thanks to uh, Hubble uh, about the visible universe. We have already explored the infrared universe using Spitzer, and we know about the X-ray universe thanks to great missions like Chandra. Now we want to learn more about the infrared um, universe using Webb, and we are going to in particular explore this big portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. And I think that you are all very familiar with all the names that you see in this plot here, gamma rays, X-ray, microwave, radius. These are all words that we use in our life because this type of radiation is present in our day-to-day -day life. But we are not used to see this um, type of light. In some cases, because we would need eyes as big as the Arecibo uh, <laughs> parabola, so we would have very big heads. In other cases, there isn't much light that is coming through the air. Astronomers are upset about that, but it is a very good thing for uh, life development. So I guess we have to live with that limitation. And we can overcome that limitation by sending telescopes into space. The reason why we want to look at the universe in the infrared, it's because this is a very good type of light to see the very distant galaxies. The, very, uh, the first galaxies, they started to form stars. They were very blue. They were emitting most of their light in the UV and in the violet light. However, because the universe is expanding and they are moving away from us with an effect that is similar to the sound that makes a, a, a car or an ambulance that is zooming away from us, also the light is stretches. And so when it arrives to us, it changes its color and it is not blue anymore, but it, it, it moved um, toward uh, very redder wavelengths and in the infrared. This is why we need a telescope that can see in the infrared. Another very good reason to look at the universe in, in the infrared, it's because when stars form, they are completely wrapped in big, thick layer of dust. And as the dust is hiding what uh, is um, uh, on the other side of a very dirty window, it is also masking the stars that are forming in region of star formation when we look them in the optical. But when we go in the infrared, as you see in here, a multitude of stars can be seen through the dust. Another great capability that Webb is providing us is the ability not only to get the ex extraordinary images, but also to spread the light into the, um, into the spectrum. And so we can see all the components of the light, all its color order from the shorter wavelength, bluer wavelengths toward the reddest wavelength. What you see here is the typical rainbow that, he, that we can see with our own eyes. Webb will see a different uh, rainbow, a redder rainbow that is in this part of the, of the diagram that we cannot see with our eyes. And if you have a telescope that has the resolution of Webb, the power of Webb, you can see that on top of the rainbows, there are often these very narrow dark lines. These are little pieces of light that have been stolen from the emission that was made at the, in, in the interior of a star by either the atmosphere of the star or gas that, we, that um, is between us and the star that we are looking at. And studying these little lines give us information about the chemical composition, about the temperature of the object that we are looking at, and about how many uh, atoms of hydrogen or oxygen or iron are in that element. So we really can weight the amount of things that are present in the universe when we study an electromagnetic spectrum simply by measuring the properties of these little dark lights. And we want to do this because, for example, if we look at the dark clouds where stars are forming, we can really go and measure all the building blocks that are going to make the stars and planets. I told you that Webb is a space telescope, so of course we have to launch it into space, and we are going to do that using the Ariane 5. This is a big rocket built by the European Space Agency, and Webb is an amazing example of an international collaboration. Webb is not only built by NASA, but it has a strong contribution from the European Space Agency and from the Canadian Space Agency. Its instruments and all the technology that is in Webb have been produced by a series of um, industries that have been working for NASA and its collaborators to make this um, big journey possible. We will launch Webb from Kourou in, uh, so, um, in French Guiana in South, uh, in South America, in this little point here. And Webb is so big that even if the Ariane 5 is a very big uh, rocket, we have to fold it multiple times and put it inside the rocket in this very compact configuration. 
The Ariane 5 shroud is 15 times 53 feet, but when web is fully open, its sun shield is 48 by 69 feet. So engineers had to find a way to fold it 12 times to fit it in that little box. And even the mirror is 20 feet in diameter. And so they had to fold the uh, side of the mirror backward as you see in this image. And if it's not too complicated enough, we are going to put the telescope at the top of the rocket up here. And then we shoot it in the sky. As I already told you, one million miles away from the Earth in a very special point that is called the uh, Sun-Earth uh, second Lagrange point. This is a point where the gravitational pull of the Sun and the Earth balance the centrifugal force. And so what happened is that the web will rotate around the Sun and the Earth, keeping always the same distance, following this beautiful dance. It will rotate around the two and around the sun, and one year of the Earth will be also one year for Webb. And um, you can also see in this video that as Webb rotates around the sun, is always keeping that diamond, that is the sun shield, facing the same side of the sun. This is done on purpose to make sure that we can keep the telescope cold. Webb is an infrared telescope, and that means that we are very bright for Webb. The Earth is very bright for Webb. Even Webb, if it was not cooled down at the right temperature, would be so bright that it would not be able to see any other star. It would just outshine everything else. So the observing side of Webb, it's the one where we have the big mirror, the secondary mirror, and the instruments that are here in the back is kept at a very cold temperatures, temperature, negative 400 Fahrenheit degree, while the side that is facing the sun is at um, 250 Fahrenheit. So it's a very big difference in temperature, more than 600 Fahrenheit between the science side and the sun facing side. And we need to create this big difference in temperature simply by taking advantage of the sun shield. This is a passive cooling method. So the heat is simply dispersed by the space that it is between these five layers that are part of the sun shield. And this sun shield is incredibly thin. The thickest layer is 0.002 inches and the other four layers are 0.001 inches. Incredibly thin, we have to stretch it very open and keep it open to make sure that the telescope is cold. The side that is facing the sun is important because it has the solar power. So we have to make sure that the web sees the sun to recharge the batteries. But we also have to make sure that, that the telescope doesn't see the sun or we will not see anything else. To arrive at its final destination, web will travel for one month. And during this one month, it will be very busy. Just a few minutes after launch, it will turn on the antenna and we are going to use this antenna to tell web everything that it has to do and to collect all the information of the fantastic data that is going to collect um, through this antenna. So if this antenna doesn't work, the mission is over. And there is a terrifying video on YouTube that starts with the first month of web will be uh, nerve wracking and there are 300 single point failure and they have all to work. And I really would prefer not to know that part, but uh, here is an ex a few examples of what must work for web to make sure that we are going to do science. There is also in um, a link, uh, uh, if you want to share in the notes of the presentation for the, uh, that shows the unfolding on the telescope. So just 20 minutes after launch, web is going to um, separate from the Ariane and then it will open the solar panel array and the arms where the sun shield is stored. This is 15 hours after launch. And six days after launch, we get ready to unwrap the sun shield. This is a very delicate, very slow operation. We will have to wait 16 hours for the entire sun shield to be fully deployed and all the layers separated. And then you can see when you compare this side of the, this image of the telescope with this one, that at a certain point, the telescope has to move the secondary mirror that is stored here in the back up in the front. This is a very important step because the light that is coming from distant galaxies bounce on the primary mirror, is reflected on the secondary, and then it enters through this little hole and it reaches the science instrument. This uh, the deployment of a secondary mirror happens about 12 days from the launch. And then 20 days after launch, we finally open completely the big mirror of web 
and one month after launch, we are ready to, uh, we reach the final destination. We talk to web through a series of antenna that are um, all uh, over, that are the, um, uh, set in California, in Spain, and in Australia. We had to choose these three points so we can always see Webb as the Earth rotate around, uh, around this axis. Webb will always be at midnight for us. And uh, all the instructions that we prepare for Webb are prepared at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Maryland. We send this instruction to one of these antenna. The antenna send instruction to Webb and Webb talk to, back to the antenna, the antenna talk back to us. And this happened just a few minutes, but those few minutes are always extremely tense for us because we want to see what the telescope is doing, how it is reacting. And then as we get confidence that the telescope is behaving properly, we are going to send longer and more complex set of instruction. And we will touch base with the telescope only three times a day as uh, we see it with the various antenna. But in the first month, we will be in constant contact with the telescope. One month uh, after launch, we are in L2, and still we are not ready to do science. The telescope is definitely too hot, so we have to wait for the telescope to cool down. And also, as the telescope cool down, it's going to shrink. So the mirror, the fantastic mirror that Webb has, will not be useful to do science. We have to align every single segment of the telescope to make sure that we get the perfect focus. And this is an extremely long, delicate, try and error um, operation where we are going to be in extra focus, lower focus. And once we are ready, uh, and we will, we will be ready about 118 days after launch, so two months after launch. And still, we need to make sure that all the instruments are working properly. All the modes that we want to use to extract all the scientific information to push web to the forefront of knowledge need to be calibrated. And that is other four months of operation. And at the end, we will declare web ready for science. And NASA will celebrate this by releasing the first images and spectra to the community to showcase the power of web. Um, so from now, this was all the technical part of web. Now let's talk a little bit about the science that we can do with web. And in particular, let's talk about star formation. This is my favorite subject. And I think it is the most important phenomenon in the universe. And I don't think that I am totally biased because uh, honestly, st stars are really changing completely the universe every time. If you think of the Big Bang, just after the Big Bang, the universe was very boring. It was very hot, very dense, very compact. There were only elemental particles, and they quickly merged to create simple atoms like hydrogen, helium, and lithium. But by the time we arrived here, the universe was much larger, much colder, and the density was considerably lower. So the universe wasn't able to do anything more complex than that. Extremely boring, very dark. However, three to 400 million after the Big Bang, million years after the Big Bang, gravity started to become the dominant force and pulled back all this atom of hydrogen and uh, helium, and it created the first stars. These stars are very different from what we used to see today. They are huge, thousands of times more massive than our sun. They're made only of hydrogen and, uh, and helium. There is nothing more in there. But in their interior, they are cooking at a furious rate new elements that we haven't seen before carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. And these stars are very big, but also very unstable. So they violently pulsate and very quickly they explode as supernova. And in doing this, they enrich the universe with all these new elements. It's the first time that we have this new element in the universe. And this changed completely the evolution of the universe from that point over. Because from now on, we can make not only big stars, also we were not able to make stars as big as those, we can still make stars that are two, three times more massive than our sun, but we can also make very small stars, stars that are half the mass of our sun, 10 times smaller than the mass of our sun. And this, star, this little star can live very long to the point that we still see this star burning hydrogen in their core in the globular clusters that are around the Milky Way and nearby galaxies. And these stars have still the chemical composition of that second generation of stars that was just contaminated by one generation of stars. In these regions, we had also very big stars, two or three times, two, three hundred times the mass of our sun. They exploded as supernovas, so they enriched the universe again with oxygen and carbon. But also we had intermediate mass stars that can create iron. 
So we finally start to have the condition not only to create stars, but also to create planets. And so I think that this is really the proof that star formation is important in changing completely the face of the universe and in enabling the life on Earth. Now, star formation is very important, and yet we don't know much about it. We still don't know why we form a very, only a small number of stars and a lot of uh, small mass stars, small mass, low mass stars. We don't know um, how stars affect the evolution of each other. We don't know if they are binaries. We don't know what happened if you have a massive stars to the planets that are nearby. And the reason why we don't know all these questions is because the star formation is very rare, especially in the Milky Way. We don't have many star forming regions. And they are, these star forming regions usually tend to form stars that are only a um, few times the mass of our star in the, of our sun in the Milky Way. And this is very important if you want to study the evolution, uh, the formation of planets and the evolution of life. But on the other hand, it doesn't tell you much about what happens in distant galaxies like, like those that we find in the early universe. So we need to look at, at other galaxies to understand what happened and how big and uh, small star can coexist together. The other big problem that we have with star formation is that usually stars form in very dusty places, and so we cannot see what's going on. This is one of the most iconic images that Hubble ever took. It's the pillar of creation in the Eagle Nebula. Hubble revisited this image a few years ago to celebrate one of its anniversary. I think it was the 25th one. And I tell you, when I look at this image, that these are huge columns of dust and gas. At the top of this column, there are stars that are forming. And you have to take my word for that because you don't see the stars. You just see a little bit of luminosity and say, okay, maybe that is the light that is coming from the stars, but you don't see them. And then because Hubble is, a, uh, because um, the new camera on Hubble is equipped also with a little bit of infrared uh, capacities, we were able to look through the dust of this region and this is how, what we saw. There is a plethora of stars that belong to the disk of the Milky Way. And also at the top of the columns, you can see the stars that I promised you were forming there. So you, can, you don't have to take my word, you can actually see them by yourself. The other things that you can see is that if somewhere the dust become transparent, in other parts, it's so thick that even Hubble cannot see through it with its infrared camera. And so we need a more powerful telescope and we need to be able to look redder to see through this, um, th through this dust. And by looking at this column at different wavelengths, we can see how the light can go through. And so we can understand the three dimensional structure of this column of gas. We can also understand their dynamic and start to figure out how stars form in these clouds. Now, Webb can also look farther in the infrared in what is called the mid-infrared. And at these wavelengths, again, the star disappear. They are, they are too hot to be seen in these wavelengths. But what becomes extremely bright, what becomes the protagonist of our observation is the dust that we despised in the optical because it was hiding everything. And here becomes the most interesting thing that we can see. The, these images are telling us what, um, um, are telling us the component of the dust and they're telling where the dust is. And also because we have as a spectro spectrograph instrument on, we can go and weight the various components of the dust and um, dig the various building block of planets and stars. I told you that the Milky Way doesn't make, doesn't form many massive stars. However, there are neighboring uh, galaxies like the large and the small Magellanic clouds that are hosting beautiful region of star formation that are forming stars that are 60, 100 times more massive than our star, uh, than our sun. And in these regions, we can see the entire ecosystem of big and low mass stars. And also we can see stars that have a very different comp com composition compared to our uh, galaxy. These stars have a chemical composition that is closer to the composition of the stars that we find in the early universe. So we have the fantastic opportunity, thanks to Hubble and Webb, to study the, how star formation occurs in conditions that are not common in the Milky Way, but they were very common in the young universe. And when we look, even with Webb, at the young universe, these star forming regions are very bright, but they are just look they are looking just like tiny dots. So we don't see all the complexity and the structure that we can highlight with Hubble and Webb in nearby galaxies. 
Understanding the process of star formation is also very important if you want to understand what happened when galaxies collide. This is another very famous image of a uh, Hubble. It's the antenna galaxies. We have two big spiral galaxies that are hitting each other. And during this collision, they started this beautiful firework. And you can see here, all these little pink knots are very young star clusters that are forming now. And all the energy that is coming from the stars that are forming there is exciting the gas, lighting it up and make it shine in the pink. And then there are regions that formed earlier that have already lost most of their gas and they are surrounded by the ring of, uh, of uh, ionized gas. And some reason, regions have already lost all their gas. However, if you look in some of the darker regions, you can see there is nothing going on. And that is not that the region is not forming stars. We cannot see it. Again, the dust is hiding very uh, strong, very intense regions of star formation that show up, for example, in the Spitzer data. Now, we know that we are losing a lot, missing a lot when we look at the antenna with Hubble. Spitzer tells us that there is more going on, but we don't have the right resolution to really appreciate what is happening in these ridden regions. And here is where Webb, again, is going to tell us much more about the process of star formation. And combining Hubble and Webb is going to really tell us how many stars can form in the collision between two galaxies and for how long star formation can continue in this process. Now, the process of star formation is very messy. Stars uh, form, and as soon as they light up, they start to blow away all the gas and the dust that they used to form. And you have an example in this image that was released last year to celebrate the 30th anniversary of Hubble operation. Here, there are a lot of bubbles and cavities that have been created by the wind that is coming from a rich cluster of stars that we cannot see because, once again, dust is hiding it from us. So the majority of the stars that are responsible for this beautiful image are hidden here. We know that they are present because we see their uh, light reflected against this beautiful uh, um, layer of gas. And also being in a cluster, especially when it's young and it is very compact, it's very uncomfortable. Stars start to pull and push. And, and sometimes some stars say, okay, I had enough and they leave the class or they get kicked out, depends. So this star here, that is NGC 2020, was expelled by the cluster and it's now leaving away. And this was a very big star. At, the, at birth, it was 60 to 80 solar masses. This means that inside here, there must be a bully that is even more massive than these stars that kick it out. Now, because uh, NGC 2020 is so big, it's also very quickly running toward its death. And um, we can see that because it's already lost part of its external envelope as a consequence of a very violent and rapid pulsation. So the outer part of the stars expanded and then the star contracted, but the outer part forgot about it. And so they continue to expand. And uh, the star will go through a few more of these episodes and then it will explode as a supernova in um, uh, in some thousand, many thousand years. Massive stars are not the only uh, source of mass in the, star, in the region of star formation. Also, low mass stars are pretty uh, chaotic. So here there is a star that is accreting, it's, um, it's still accreting material from its disk here. We cannot see the disk because this is a, a, an optical image. And so what we see is just the shadow of the disk against the silhouette of the star. But not all the material remain on the star. Most of, some of the material is actually ejected back through these beautiful jets. And this is not a constant flow. You can see by the fact that there are all these bow shots that the jet is expelled in phases. And uh, we, can, we want to study how fast these jets are moving, what is the composition of this jet, because it's telling something about how the material gets cooked by all this um, interaction and all this chaos that is going through. So Webb can help us in, uh, in, in this by taking beautiful picture and also by um, using spectra and telling us the composition of this. But all this confusion is canceling the initial condition that led to the formation of stars. So when we look at these regions, they are beautiful, they are breathtaking, but still we do not learn what was at the beginning uh, uh, of the star process of star formation. And so thanks to Webb, we are going to study regions that are considerably more boring 
They are not forming star yet. There is a nothing in there that yet ex in there except dust, very thick dust. And they, these regions are so dusty that the light cannot go through even in the infrared. This image was taken by Spitzer. And uh, the dark cloud that you see in the center has been nicknamed the brick because really it's a big brick of dust. Webb will be able to look through this um, cloud and uh, examine the light of the stars that are in the background. And because Webb is equipped with an amazing set of filters, we'll be able to take images in many different colors and analyze how the light of the background stars behave as it goes through the dusty cloud. And so this will really tell us the chemical, the, the structure of the cloud. And also by looking at this region multiple times, we will be able to see um, how the, the dust is moving and reorganizing and getting information about the turbulence that is occurring inside the cloud. And we think it is a main dri uh, driver of star formation. Now the process of star formation is really strongly tied to the formation of planets. We know that when stars form, they develop very quickly very thick dusty disks. We've seen them with Hubble around uh, in star forming regions like Orion around the little stars as dark rings. In the optical, again, the dust is dark, so we don't see them shining, but we can see, for example, the gas that gets excited by the radiation that comes from the central star and it is on the top of the disk. When we look at this, uh, at Beta Pictoris, for example, another, uh, stars that are seen uh, add on, in, when we look at this region in the ultraviolet. Beta Pictoris has been studied in extreme detail. And so we know, for example, that in this system, there are already rocky structure and uh, there are asteroid-like structure. And sometimes we've even, we've, we have even seen comets zooming through the, the system. What we want to do here is once again, look at this region with, the, with web and take the spectra at the various distances to find out where is the snow region and where um, ices of methane and ammonia and um, uh, carbon dioxide are forming. Because these together with water are the building block of the amino acid that are leading to the formation of life. And also this is a very good way to bring hydrogen on Earth and other uh, rocky planets. Hydrogen is very volatile. There is a lot of hydrogen in the sun and in the stars, but in the disk, hydrogen is very quickly pushed away by the radiation that is coming from the forming star. However, in the dusty disks that are in stars, there are also very thin dusty grain. And these dusty grains are perfect a point to anchor hydrogen and oxygen and other elements and to create the seed for icy layers that can grow and, or, um, and become, for example, icy asteroid and comets. And we know that this system then can bombard the, um, the rocky planet. We've seen the pools of this older episode, for example, on the source of the moon and on, uh, um, and on uh, other uh, Mercury, uh, Mercury and so on. So what we're going to do with the web is to go into study multiple disks. Thanks to Alma, we know that disks evolve very quickly. And so they move from system that are smooth and flat. And then they start to develop little pebbles that rotate around their stars and they collect gas. And in doing this, they are creating cavities and rings. So we want to observe planets and we want to study um, planetary disks. Um, at different evolutionary stage, really to see how the various ices are moving through the disks and how the chemical composition of the disk is changing to understand how water can arrive on Earth, for example. This is another example of a planet that is forming around its stars and it's creating a cavity in the disk. But also we can see that this can be strongly affected by the presence of nearby stars. Here, the, the stars are masked using a, so that we can better appreciate the light that is coming from the disk. And you can see that on one side, the disk is extended and the other side, the disk is pushed back by the radiation that is coming from the other sun, from the other star. In addition to study the disk, we can actually study the properties of a, a planet for example, we can look at planets that are quickly orbiting around their sun. 
In this case, when the orbit is just a few days long, what happens is that the orbit is locked. And so the planet is, face, is always showing the same side to the, to the star. And so there is a big difference in temperature between the, the day side of the planet and the night side of the planet. And depending on the properties of the atmosphere of the planet, if there is a thick or a thin atmosphere, we can see very different um, uh, temperature changes between the day and the night. And if there is a thick atmosphere as the planets rotate, when we look at it diff in different filters, we can have an idea of the stratification of the atmosphere. But on the other hand, if the planet has a thin atmosphere, we don't learn much about the atmosphere, but we learn a lot about this uh, uh, rocky surface. So it's one of the cases where regardless of what you get, it's always a win-win and you learn something. Of course, I work for a spectrograph, so I'm going to tell you again that spectroscopy is going to teach you a lot. And if the planet transit in front of a star and you look at it with a spectrograph, by comparing the spectra of the star before the transit and during the transit, you can see that the thin atmosphere, look how thin is the atmosphere of the Earth compared to the diameter of the planet. The atmosphere of the other planets is, is uh, quite similar. And as this thin layer of gas travels through in front of the star, it's going to steal a little bit of light and if we subtract one uh, spectrum to the other, we can see the, the signature of the chemical composition of the atmosphere of the planet. And so this is how the atmosphere of the Earth would look like to Webb if we were looking at it from uh, outside. And this is how Neptune would look like, a warm Neptune. And this is how a hot Jupiter would look like. So you see that there are differences in chemical composition. There are differences due to the difference in temperature and difference in the shape of the line due to the different gravity, uh, surface gravity of the planet. And uh, with this, I uh, stop my presentation and I can take some questions if you want. Thank you for your time. Fantastic. Everyone, please give her a virtual round of applause, please. Dr. Ellen Asabi, you did a phenomenal job. And there are some questions in the chat box, so we can go ahead and start Q&A. All right. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> he did a clap for you. Thank you. So we're going to start with Q&A. Um, the very first question comes, actually, it was right after um, you gotten started. Um, Dr. Savi, and the question was, is from Miss Irene. She said, what do you mean by irregular? Do you recall at the beginning of your presentation yes. where you were talking about something being irregular? Yes, so uh, galaxies, um, most of the galaxies in the nearby universe are either, uh, look either like uh, elliptical galaxies, so that they are sort of eggs, big eggs, and very uniform in the distribution of the stars, or they look like uh, spiral galaxies, like those that you can see in this image here. So you have these beautiful arches, and, and this is a very uh, clear spiral. And in, in, in this type of galaxies, stars are forming along the spiral arms, and then uh, in, the, in the space between the spiral arms, there are older population of stars. In the early universe, the structure of the galaxies is much more irregular. So they are not round, they are not spiral, they are all elongated and distorted, and they don't have a, they have a sort of amorphous shape, and this is why we call them irregular. And star formation is occurring in different places, and it's not nicely distributed. Well, awesome. Thank you for your thorough explanation of that. And I also want to comment that there has been a lot of applause in the chat, as well as you being very clear about your, um, your presentation and how it's easy to understand. So I thank you for that. Mr. Williams said in, uh, in the chat, while your presentation is a textbook on how to give a clear, elegant, and informative presentation. And he says, thank you. So Thank you, you did a fantastic job. All right. So the next question from Q and A, and I'll and of course, Grace, you can jump in when you get ready. This comes from Mr. Daniel. He said, "Which targets will be used during the commission calibration and testing during the six-month period?" 
That's a very good question. And there is a multitude of targets that we are going to use depending on what we want to study. So initially we will look at a bright star, just one single star to align the mirrors. And the mirrors at the moment are looking all over the place. And so the first image that we will get for one star will be 18 different images. And then we have to have all these different images to merge into one single star that becomes nice and sharp. But then there is an area in the Large Magellanic Cloud that is very rich of stars and it is very uniform distributed. And we are going to look at this region to measure carefully the distance between stars and correct for what are called the geometric distortions. That is how the uh, stars are projected on the image um, on the field of the detector is different from the distance that they have in the sky. And so that creates a distortion and we need to remove that distortion through um, the analysis of the real position. Uh, we are going to look at stars that have very well known um, luminosity. These are called um, calibration standards and we are going to use them to make sure that we really know how many electrons hit the, the, the telescope per second, how bright it's the source that corresponds to that so that we can carefully measure the distance of an object. And we don't say something like, oh, all of a sudden the Virgo cluster is inside the solar system because we had the calibration wrong. So these are all very well-known objects that we are going to measure just to test how Webb is performing and then to make sure that astronomers can get the right result when they measure the distance objects. Awesome. The next question comes from Ms. Singh. It says, why does a star increase its brightness by time? That's a very good question. Uh, the, the, at the beginning, the stars start to increase its brightness when it starts to burn hydrogen in its uh, core. Initially, it shines only because of gravitational pressure. It's contracting and that heats up the material. When it's, uh, when it's dense enough in the core, it can start to burn the hydrogen. And that is the first time that the, uh, the star increases its luminosity. And then it... Um, as the stars evolve, at a certain point, it stops burning hydrogen in its core and it burns hydrogen in the shell. The core starts to contract and to maintain the equilibrium, the outer part of the star expands. And so lights can go out faster, easier from the star. And so the star becomes brighter just because it, it's easier to escape from the star. So there, there are these pulsations and then there are changes in temperature. So sometimes the star becomes brighter in a wavelength, but fainter in another. Or if you want, it changes color, it goes from yellow to red or from blue to red and then comes back. So it's a signature of what is going on in its interior, basically. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna jump in and uh, pose some of the questions that we have through the chat. So first off, um, will the James Webb be visible um, without a telescope or binoculars? No, we cannot see it by eyes, but uh, you can see it with a binocular or the telescope, yes. Great. Uh, next, uh, Harold asks, are there plans to take another look at the Hubble deep fields using the web? Oh yeah, there's a, the, there are already, the, we've already, uh, the astronomical community has already uh, request time to observe with web and the observation has been already approved. And so we are looking at the ultra deep field. We are also going to look at the frontier fields that are those beautiful regions where you can see the gravitational arches and that allowed Hubble to see beyond what would be its physical limit just by taking advantage of general relativity. So definitely these are among the first targets that web is going to look at in the first year of operation. And we are all very excited to look at those regions. Awesome. Um, yeah, that's going to be amazing. Uh, another quick question. I think you covered this one, but let's review. How long do signals from the Earth take to reach the web? It is just a few minutes. Uh, I think that between back and forth is about eight minutes. No, it's four minutes delay between back and forth. And, you know, so it's just, it's very short uh, wait. Okay. Thank you. And then um, we also have a question from John. Is it thought that planetary bodies form from the protoplanetary disk before or after the beginning of stellar fusion? Um, 
We think that it is still in the contraction phase. Uh, the star has already uh, collected most of its material, but it's not burning hydrogen yet in uh, its interior. It's in the phase that is called the Titori, when the, um, we are at the end of the clearing of the, of the disk. And then also the, clear, the disk is cleared at different phases. So we start uh, with the in inner part and then we move forward. And then another part that we don't know exactly is um, how the big and the small planet form, how they move back and forth. What we start to believe is that this, the solar system is not a very common system. In all the stars that we look at so far, we see that there are usually either um, a super Earth or mini Jupiter, mini Neptune. And in the solar system, we don't have neither, right? We have an Earth and we have a big <laughs> Jupiter and, and Neptune. So, so something different happened uh, that led to the formation of the solar system. And we need to understand the regular system before we can address what happened in the solar system. Thank you. Okay, well, I will take one more. Um, we're, and then I'll pass it back to Sherelle. Um, but that last question kind of relates to one that we have in the Q&A. Mishka asks, how long does it take for a star to form? That is a big question. Uh, there are different type <laughs> theory depending on the model that you're using. Uh, very massive stars do everything very quickly. And so just one million year after the beginning, they are burning hydrogen in their nucleus. They are perfectly shined. They, they are ready to do their life. And they're not going to live much long. They're longer. They're going to explode the supernova four or five million years after their birth. So those, those are very fast objects. But then as you go uh, to our uh, lower mass stars, it can take several million years. Like something like the sun takes uh, about 50 to 100 million years to be ready to reach the main sequence and start to really burn hydrogen in its nuclear. So it's really mass dependent. And the smaller the mass, the longer the life. So our shorty, we are good. <laughs> that is, is just incredible. And so speaking of the sun, um, here's a question from Daniel. The sun is a type G yellow dwarf star. How common is this type of star in the Milky Way galaxy? I'm not sure I understand the question. <laughs> it's, it's a pretty common star. The, the most common star is uh, are the red dwarf stars. But uh, the second common star is, uh, is the sun. When, when you have an episode of star formation, 60% of the stars that you form are of the mass of the sun or smaller. And then only a very small number of stars form uh, at the higher masses. And uh, the sun and the lower mass stars are also very common because they can live a very long, right? The sun, the sun can live 9 billion years. So if you start to create many suns, you can find them uh, you know, many generation of, of star like the sun, you can find them in the Milky Way. Sure. Okay, well, awesome. We're gonna go on to our next question that's in Q&A. Will the James Webb Space Telescope be studying the star formation in dwarf galaxies, like specifically the abnormally high star formation in the Tarantula Nebula? Okay. So the Tarantula Nebula is not a, a dwarf galaxy. It's just okay. a small portion of the Large Magellanic Cloud. And yes, we have time to look at the Tarantula Nebula. And I am very excited because I am part of the project that is going to look at the Tarantula Nebula. Yay! <laughs> and and uh, we are looking at many dwarf galaxies. There are many projects that want to look at star formation in dwarf galaxies to answer a different question. And they are looking at dwarf galaxies that have different characteristics. So yes, definitely. Well, that's exciting. So we are all rooting and supporting you. So we're <laughs> gonna um, have our last question before we start to uh, wrap some things up and give our last little speaking points. But here from Richard says, how does the J-12 Space Telescope spectral resolution compared to Hubble and ground-based telescopes? Okay, that's a very good question. Uh, it's very different because we are looking at very different wavelengths. And uh, web is, um, it depends on the instrument that you're looking at. In the infrared, the spectral resolution of web can be up to 20 times better than Hubble and the sensitivity can be 50 times better than Hubble. 
When you move to other wavelengths, the situation can be very different. Like um, the STIS spectrograph has a higher resolution uh, compared to web. Uh, from the ground, uh, the comparison is very unfair. There are some spectrograph that can have uh, 10 times better resolution uh, than uh, even 50 times better resolution than web, but they're also looking at very different wavelengths. And so, and so they're going to see very different things and answering very different questions. Thank you. Okay, so um, we're just about at the hour. So we're gonna do a couple more polls just to kind of wrap up, but I wanna let you all know that uh, Dr. Sabi has agreed to stay on for about 15 more minutes to continue this Q&A because we're having a great discussion. So if you want to get your question answered or you wanna hear continued discussion, you're free to stick around. If you need to run because we're at, uh, at the hour, we just ask that you participate in our final poll questions and then we thank you for coming and you can head out. Um, so our poll questions have been launched. We'd like to know how tonight's program affected your interest and awareness in the James Webb and its scientific mission. We'd like to know if you are gonna come back to another one of our public lectures and we'll put some more information into the chat about the ones that are coming up. And then finally, if you're not already subscribed, we can um, be sharing out some of our email notifications with you. So in this chat, uh, excuse me, in this poll question, you can let us know if you'd like to receive those emails and about which ones you'd want to hear. So there's three questions here. I'll give you another second. Um, and I will put a little bit of information into our chat. You can see the launch on the NASA channel. Oh yeah, definitely. So the launch will be on NASA's. Um, it could be early, but. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's very early in the morning, right? Yes, I, I have to go at three in the morning to get, prepare the, the room Ooh. for the celebrations. We are going to have a party at the Space Telescope. So. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna end the poll now. Um, thank you all. So um, as we said, you can stick around. We'll do Q&A for about 15 more minutes. Uh, if you're heading out now or later, another reminder, when you leave this Zoom, you're gonna be directed to, toward a survey. It's optional, but we really appreciate your feedback and it helps us design our future programs. So don't forget to do the survey. Okay, so I'm done with that little interruption. Now we're gonna go into the bonus portion. We're gonna get back to the Q&A. Um, so let me actually grab one of the questions that we got through YouTube. Um, so we had someone in the YouTube ask, can the James Webb Space Telescope study early large structures um, as well as stars and planets? And how will it do that? So Webb is designed to look at the early galaxies. And so I, I guess this is what they're asking about. Uh, we are not going to see the spider web that is, uh, we see sometimes in the simulations that show how we feed on the galaxy. However, we want to see uh, how the big knots of material that are moving through the spider webs are merging to create the first galaxies. There are different models that predict how this can happen. And for example, there is not even agreement if we're going to have first galaxies and then stars or stars and then galaxies. And so this is why we want to look very early in the universe to try to understand what's going on there. And in that sense, Webb is going to study the larger structures. And of course, we are not going to see the underlying dark matter because it's dark and it doesn't interact with the regular lights, no matter the wavelengths. All right, thank you. And then we have one other question. Um, so from, from the YouTube that asks, um, where it says, I would love to hear more about observing the first stars to ever form. Will we actually see some of the first supernova or will we just see secondary effects? We don't know. It depends uh, on many factors. One thing that we don't know is if really these stars are going to explode as supernova or if they're going to implode after they release most of their external layers. 
even if they explode as a supernova, it really depends on when this first explosion occurred. So uh, that is, there are different uh, answers depending on the model of cosmology and how we, um, sorry, uh, about the various variables that we put in, the, uh, in, in our understanding of cosmology. And so this is why we want to see that. Not seeing them, it's already an answer because it means that it happened before the distance that we can go or that they are less energetic than we expected. So again, it's a win-win it's a result regardless of what we see or we don't see. Awesome. All right. So we're going to go back to our lineup here. And this is from Priya. And Priya said, how can you, um, how can we know about stars even through the dust around that? How can we know about stars even through the dust that's around it? Right. So uh, to, to understand about to understand what's going on and their properties, we need to, to see through the dust, right? And so uh, I'm trying to look at the and, and so we need to instead of looking at the stars in this condition, that is what we see with Hubble, we need to look in the infrared so that we can really appreciate all the light that is coming from the star. And um, what we do usually now is to uh, look at these regions with multiple filters and compare how the star becomes brighter and fainter. And this gives us information about its temperature, about its mass. And, and then by looking at different regions that are more or less evolved and they have a rich number of stars, we can compare their properties and we can start to create a sort of uh, evolutionary pattern. And we can try to understand how fast this type of stars evolve, how, how much time they need to grow and to emerge from their cocoons. So we, we have a lot of pieces of information. And then with web, we are going to put other, uh, add other tasks to our, um, our, our pieces to our puzzle to figure out uh, all, all the process. Totally understandable. A question from Jim states, how long of an overlap is expected between Hubble and Webb missions? At this point, we think that we might be uh, lucky enough to have Hubble operating till the end of 3030, 2030, sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, wow, I don't think there is. <laughs> I'm an optimist. <laughs> yeah, 3030. <laughs> And then uh, web, uh, the web mission is scheduled to last five years after launch. And then if we have enough fuel, and if we launch on December 18th, we should definitely have enough fuel. We can continue the operation for other five years. And then, uh, I, I don't know, last week I heard John Mother say that maybe we couldn't even have it for 15 years. So I'm keeping my finger crossed. <laughs> maybe he's not as optimistic as I am, but he's also pretty optimistic. So. <laughs> So, yeah. uh, and Grace said, and Grace jokingly said, Hubble forever. <laughs> I I totally agree. Do an <laughs> another Q&A question before you go into another one. Uh, oh, yeah. So let's do. Um, so this is a great question. Katie wants to know, will the James Webb be used to study Mercury? No, we cannot study Mercury because it's in the inner part of the Earth orbit. It's too close to the sun. However, we are going to use it to start the external planets like uh, Jupiter and Saturn. And there is also a lot of interest to study the moons around the giant ga um, gaseous planets because some of them may have uh, the initial condition, uh, not for life, but at least the element that can support life, right? So they are very interesting. Thank you. And we kind of already talked about the expected lifespan of the James Webb. But Chris also wants to know what are the factors that are going to affect that lifespan? Okay, uh, so um, the first factor is the success of the mission. If uh, astronomers are getting great results and they are uh, in applying and getting time and, and showing the power of web, then NASA uh, will be uh, more interested in extending the mission. So we need to be very uh, fast in uh, jumping on the data that web is going to uh, release. Uh, another key factor is when we launch, how far is Webb from the moon? The moon has a gravitational pull. And so if uh, we have an unfavorable launch window and we pass through the moon, we need to use more 
fuel to push Webinar 2, and that will reduce the, uh, the lifetime of the mission because to rotate around L2, we need to constantly adjust Web and pull it back, and otherwise it drift away. And uh, so if uh, we launch between December 18th and December 23, for example, it's a very good time for us and we can have a much longer mission because we have more of a fuel. And then of course, if you've seen the horrendous uh, gravity movie where there is the thing that is mashing against Hubble, if something like that happened, that it's the end of the mission, but of course it will not happen. <laughs> no! I know it was a horrible it's movie not. for every possible reason. Wow. Including the fact that they killed Abel. A question from Ashley, and thank you for your response. A question from Ashley reads, are there molecules you wish James Webb could detect but cannot because those molecules are observable past the mid-infrared range? Also, will James Webb be able to observe certain isotopes? Which isotopes? Sorry, I didn't hear. She just said certain. Okay, so yes, definitely there is a lot that uh, it's very interesting, especially for planet and star formation in the mid to far infrared. And um, so last week uh, we had the result from the decadal survey and there is a proposal to do a process, um, an explorer mission to look farther in the infrared. We also had a telescope that already started to look at farther in the infrared than Webb can uh, explore. And they demonstrated that definitely there is a lot that we can learn from there. Um, the, so we still can dream for bigger and more technological instrument in the future, of course. Um, and uh, no, I don't know about these isotopes. <laughs> I, I didn't read. Sorry. Oh, no problems at all. So thank you also for your transparency and your honesty because it's some things that, hey, you may not know and that's quite all right. Um, a question that comes from Bob. Oh, Grace, were you gonna say something? I was gonna say, if you're interested in uh, studying exoplanets, um, that is gonna be the topic of our next CESS Yay! presentation. And that will be in January. So come back for that one and we will, get an answer about isotopes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, LP, I will deliver. A question from Bob Reed. Um, do the recent discoveries from gravity waves open up new questions for, for Webb to study? Yeah, we want to know what is uh, before, right? The gravity waves, we want to see the progenitors. And so one thing that is usually, uh, that, uh, what happens usually when we have one of these triggers, we, are, we all jump with the Hubble to see if there is something there left, if there are other signature, and Webb can look at these regions again in other wavelengths. So for example, we can see if there is a dust left behind and in the mid infrared, this would be a very good signature for Webb to look at. Also, um, if you are lucky and you look at that region before the gravity wave happened, you can also try to see what was the progenitor, right? What was there before the episode occurred? So um, this is also why we have this beautiful archive that is collecting all the data that Hubble um, has uh, observed. Uh, uh, all, all, all the data that I've acquired for the past 30 years. And we are going to feed the archive also with web so that we can expand our knowledge and our, our background. Yeah. And this comes from Mr. William. He said the web is so complex. How do you not worry about it? I... You know, it's a, it's a very complex mission and we worked on it for 20 years. We did a lot of testing, very complex testing. We found that we made many mistakes and because we were doing so many careful testing, we were able to correct them. So it's definitely a great thing. Um, at the moment, I am so excited of being part of something that is going to make history. I feel I am part of history. And so that is really what is... Uh, exciting me and keeping me awake at night rather than worrying about what can go wrong. We tested a lot of scenarios that can go wrong and we are actually prepared to fix them. So for example, many of the components that are on web are redundant. And if something breaks up, we can 
uh, use the other component. We, the same thing is on Hubble, right? So uh, we already had a couple of times that we had to change the electronic of an instrument because it was not working and we were able to continue operation. And Web will do the same. So nothing is perfect, but we are working hard to do our best. <laughs> Exactly. Go ahead, Gary. I was just going to take the next question. So we've got a great question from Richard that asks, which data are you most excited to see from the James Webb? So in, in exchange of the, um, of the work that the various team have done in, um, in the past many years to build the instrument, this team got guarantee time. And so Web is going to look at two of my favorite star forming regions that are the Tarantula Nebula and NGC 346. And also uh, with my collaborator, Peter Zeidler, we were also allowed to go to look at another very beautiful star forming region that is uh, NGC 602. It's a little uh, star forming region at the edge of the small Magellanic Cloud. And, uh, it's really showing multiple generation of stars that are emerging now from the gas. And so we are all waiting to see what is hidden in this big pillar that you see in this image, but they are uh, 60,000 uh, 60, uh, parsec away from us. Oh, that's so exciting. <laughs> um, but this kind of brings up Richard's next question. Um, so there's all this scheduled time, but Richard asks how mobile is the James Webb for events. Um, it looks very large and delicate. Could it be turned quickly for a gamma ray burst or a radio outburst? Of course. Uh, That's uh, probably not going to be our major worry if that happened, because we will be also in, in some danger if that happened. So yes, of course, uh, uh, web is big, it's delicate, but for example, if a meteorite hit one of the mirror, uh, of the 18 mirror, we are not going to lose the mirror. We can readjust them to fix the, um, the problem. And the sun shield, it looks very thin, very um, delicate, but there are a lot of uh, su sewing structure, so that if a meteorite hit one of the, uh, of the layer, it's not going to completely rip it off. The, these little sewing are going to stop the damage. And so there are going to be only small holes. And there are a lot of other um, solutions like this that are making web much sturdier than it looks. And I think that's really, it's amazing the work that engineers had to do to make something that is so big and also so light. One of the big challenges in launching something in space is to make it light. So Hubble is 18, 1800 pounds web that is much bigger than Hubble. Hubble is a school bus, web is a tennis court. Web is only 800 pounds. So it's incredibly light compared to Hubble, right? It's amazing. And uh, it's really a testament of the ingenuity of the engineers that are working for NASA, Norton Gubern, and all the other partners of the web mission. That's incredible. I had not, not heard that statistic before. That's crazy. Um, all right, so another question from William who asks, um, will all of the web data be available to everyone, to the public? Yes, all the data that Web will, take, uh, web will collect, exactly as the data that Hubble uh, take becomes available to the public one year after the science team has done their research. Some teams sometimes decided to uh, make their data uh, public available immediately. All the large programs make their data uh, available immediately, but then the small teams, because they have less resources, they are granted sometimes to do their analysis. And, but, but then everything becomes available because the richness of the archive is really important. And people are now, for example, publishing more paper from the data that Hubble collected in the past than from the new observation, just because it's so rich. And we, we are still discovering so many things from this data. I have a uh, final two questions and they're gonna come from YouTube if you, if, Grace, if you don't have any more questions. I have two questions from YouTube. This comes from Simon. He asks, could James Webb potentially see an early exosystem with hundreds of um, protoplanets? 
if those new planets are hot? Well, a hot planet is quite cold. So yes, we well, can see that. <laughs> it's right. even, even the cooler stars are uh, actually very bright for Webb. It's, so Webb can see uh, um, low mass stars and brown dwarfs that are considerably hotter than normal planets. And, and they are in, uh, there are filters that are specifically dedicated to this type of objects. So definitely hot uh, planets are an ideal target for web. Awesome, thank you for your response on that question. And then um, alternative question will be, will the observing time of James Webb have allotted to the Trappist, to the Trappist system be enough to detect a biosignature in the first round? That's a good question. I think that the, the idea is to get the, the spectra as soon as possible. At the first time you're looking at the spectra, you're going to see if there is uh, water, if there is methane, if there is ammonia. These are the biosignatures that we, we can see, right? It's not that we're going to see something like uh, chlorophylla or something like that, right? We cannot say that there are plants on the planet, but we, we can see that definitely see if there is water as soon as we look at those spectra. That is the first thing that we're going to look for. <laughs> Well, awesome. Well, you know what? I definitely have to give you your flowers. You did an amazing job, Dr. Savvy. And we're so happy that you decided to stay behind to answer those Q&A questions. We want to thank our audience and our YouTube guests for joining us tonight. Again, this is part of our thematic series. So come back in, did you say January, Grace? All right, just making sure that. So please join us again for our January um, presentation. It will be on exoplanets. And so I'm so excited that you guys joined us tonight and we're looking forward to joining us in the future. Everyone, you be safe. Again, Dr. Savvy, thank you so much for your presentation, your amazing job. Grace, thank you for your assistance. And Christine, thank you for your assistance as well. Good night, everyone from the Lunar and Planetary Institute. Thank you very much for having me here. It was beautiful.